Good night, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Globes Fan 24-7. Tonight, I, Asha Kisun, will be your host, and I'd like to say to the audience that we have a very interesting discussion tonight. I will start by introducing my guest that is with me at the moment, Mr. Timothy Jonas, Chairman of Union United Ghana. Thank you for being with us, Timothy. How are you, Asha? It's good to see you again after a long time. I know you're expecting a couple of dignitaries to come along as well. Hopefully we won't yeah. wait too long for them. We're expecting Honorable Lennox Schumann to join us soon and Professor Paul Tennessee from the Roraima Institute. As they join, they will come on with us, but let's jump right into it. Tonight, we are discussing the implementation of the Plan to Prosperity, which, quote unquote, is the People's Progressive Party. And in fact, so this Okay, he's still set it up. Like I'm saying, as it is, a new government has been in with us, and we have been hearing talk along the way of promises that have not been fulfilled, some have been done. So tonight's discussion is basically based on what they have promised in their manifesto, what they have been done, and that's also quite a few areas that we feel could have been improved upon. Um, Mr. Jonas, as you're already here with me, what's your feel of the way the government has handled um, getting into transition to being in Parliament at the moment, given COVID-19 carrying out projects? How, how do you see it so far? I think it's early to talk about carrying out projects, but we've seen a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm. Um, the government has certainly learned from its predecessor and maybe from its own past. The Even the supporters of its predecessor criticized their own government for living in ivory towers and not reaching out to the people. That is something you can never accuse the, the leadership of doing. They go down into the villages and into the streets. They talk to everybody. They set aside times for um, for interviews and meetings and, and all of that. They like the photo ops. So you see a picture of a CEO loading a bag of sugar onto a trolley, or you see a, um, a minister handing out a, a, a mask to somebody in Stavrop Market. And they like these photo ops. And of course, all the loyal supporters say well done. I also say well done so far. I have seen a lot of energy. There have been some problems, and I'm sure you're going to identify them to discuss. I think it's too soon to talk about project implementation, but it certainly isn't too soon to talk about transparency in the award of contracts and in the grants of jobs. Definitely. Mr. Paul Tennessee, welcome. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here with us tonight. We're speaking about the imp implementation of the Plan to Prosperity, which is the manifesto of the PPP. Tonight should be a positive discussion. We'd like to pick out things we love about it, things we've seen happening, and perhaps areas where we feel there could be some improvement. My first question to you, because I know you're not in Ghana, as an outsider looking in who is passionate about his country, um, how do you feel about the transition of the new government into parliament? Have they been doing enough so far, in your opinion? Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to point out that I go to Guyana very regularly, and the only reason I wasn't there very recently is because of COVID. But I'll be there next month continuing uh, listening interviews for the Roraima Institute. Now, last in 2019, February, uh, former President Barra Jagdeo, as leader of General Secretary of the PPP, issued an invitation to stakeholders forum on a framework for national development. Um, unfortunately, I arrived a bit late for that event at New Thriving, but I was able to speak to people and collect uh, some documents. 
and they focus on economic growth, jobs, income, wealth creation, enhancing the well-being for, of Guyanese, national security and sovereignty, and governance. Now, first of all, that is a very good initiative when you use the word stakeholders and you include civil society, the private sector, the professionals, and even Guyanese abroad, because uh, we were invited, and you know, myself and the president of the Roraima Institute. Um, the, th the name of the manifesto is Stronger to get stronger together for a better Guyana. And I listened to the presentation of the manifesto by President Irfan Ali and by uh, former President Jack Dale. And uh, they seem to have spent a lot of time thinking through the problems of Guyana. Of course, they come to the table with a lot of experience, but it seems to me that they divided it in terms of the technical people and also the needs of people, grassroots people that they had collected. And what they were working on is a national strategy. Now, from the perspective, uh, I have looked at the manifesto, they promised 50,000 jobs, 50,000 house lots. Now, there are parts of all manifestos that, uh, that make promises. So the problem is this, or the challenge is this. Like an institute like ours, we are going to monitor these policies and to see how they're being implemented. Jonas is correct. One month is not uh, sufficient to judge a, a government. We usually, we, we usually say 100 days, three months, and that kind of thing. But I am impressed, and I think because they have a combination of experienced people and youth, I, I am impressed with the smooth efficient uh, transition. The ministers were put in place. Uh, people were put on board, including yourself, um, very quickly. Um, and a lot of measures were being taken. Parliament was reconvened, a budget was approved because they did a lot of work before. And this was very important. They have already signaled in the budget some of the things they promised. The, in the previous government, a year after, uh, in 2016, I did listening interviews in five regions and predicted that the AP and UAFC was in trouble. I knew they would love the local government election because the opinion, not even a full year, was disillusionment with the promises they had made when they had increased their salaries and all that. Anyhow, so... When I go back in November, I'll continue the listening interviews now on this government to see how they are implementing. But they have already taken some measures. Uh, the question of pensions, the question of subsidies, and the commitment to lower taxes. I could remember being with the taxi drivers of all ethnic groups that they were saying these taxes were too much for them. So <coughs> for now, then there is a problem of the oil sector, oil and gas sector. Now, there were a lot of issues, are you aware, in the previous government from a lot of delays in making public the contract and so on and so forth. Okay, so they have been able to conclude uh, an agreement, at least a licensing agreement. There is still a lot of conversation in the public square in Guyana about it. I've been following it very keenly. But also they have set up something called, uh, and the president of the Ryman Institute, Floyd Hayes, is on it. So we are in touch, I'm in touch with him all the time, discussing ideas of how that will work, and that is local content. Now, there is a belief and there is a strategy, and also from my experience of having studied thoroughly the oil industry in Venezuela, I've written a book on it, I've written about oil nationalization. So I'm very aware about the 100 years experience of Venezuelan oil industry, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, it seems to me that the strategy of the current government is to emphasize the development of local content. Now, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, it makes a lot of sense in, the, in that the hope is that you will transform oil and gas resources or the income into industries in Guyana. And the way to do this is the expansion of the private sector. 
But, you know, even if we um, expand the private sector, uh, we have to do it in a way that it will include, it will be inclusive and bring in new people. For example, the, the person who is cooking, cleaning, security guard, a policeman, the ordinary grassroots people, they are going to ask the question, how are, am I benefiting? I like to give the example of Trinidad and Tobago, another country I know very well. And um, I was impressed when I was in that country doing a trade consultancy for Point Lisa's Industrial Estate that I heard on the radio and talking to people that they give seven days work to everybody in Trinidad who's unemployed. India gives a hundred. They give seven days. So I went to Chaguanas and went to several homes to ask people, what do you do with the income of seven days? They said, Paul, you see that television? That's seven days. You see that book bag my daughter has? That is seven days. So you see with poor people, they have very little. And when they get something, it's more important than when the wealthy people get something, get a contract, get to build a road or do something. So what I'm saying is that in managing this local content, it's complex. The most important thing is you could have, uh, and I've looked, I've been to uh, try to match, do much making. I used to take for $2,000 Trinidad businessmen to various states of Venezuela and match them, like in the state of Bolivar, valves with valves, people who needed valves. And you could see the downstream industries that Venezuela created because in the state of Bolivar, they had iron ore and they had a smelter, they had bauxite, they had a smelter, and they had the Guri Dam. And linked to those industries were downstreams. Now, you have to have there are a number of issues you have to deal with. Like you have to have a lot of uh, international standards. You have to have people technically trained. So what we have to do is to anticipate as we go along, we have to anticipate what kind of downstream industries are going into local content and what kind of technical know-how we need. You know, when I studied the Venezuelan oil industry in the early days of its development, they depended on a lot of English speaking Caribbean people to go and work for Exxon down there. The precursor of Exxon was Standard Oil. The, a lot of Caribbean people went to that industry. And, um, and so it is that if we do not train our people, we have to have some six months program and nine months program. It cannot oh, be long term programs. Into all those details down in the show, I can see you Sorry have a lot to that. share. I love details. <laughs> I know it's that. A bad I realize that. <laughs> so we'll get into all those details. You brought up an interesting point, though, and seeing that we have one of our best legal minds on the show with us tonight, the issue of the Payara contract that was made public. Mr. Jonas, can you please give us um, a little breakdown of that contract and? Was it done in the right way? That's the question everybody on the ground is asking. I, I think the personal question, Asha, is um, did we have a choice? <laughs> exactly. I, you see, when we started and, and when we were, when the PPP was campaigning, part of the campaign built on the suspicion that the public have against the administration, whether it's an AFNO administration or a PPP administration, about the secretive deals that they like to make. Um, you will remember before 2015, Chanji block, um, the oil blocks, the suspicions around those oil blocks, the, the fact that the public didn't know they had gone. And then under Winston Jordan and Rafael Trotman, the public didn't know the new contract had been signed, didn't know about the signing bonus. Our leaders chose not to tell us about how our assets, our state assets, were being sold and dissipated. So that was a big concern, transparency, secrecy, and the corruption that secrecy breeds. And therefore, one of the campaign platforms was we need to renegotiate these terrible contracts that our leaders secretly entered corruptly. I think a lot of that was noise. Um, there's no doubt that our negotiation of the contracts has been riddled with 
incompetence born of lack of knowledge, lack of experience. A, a large concern for me with the contracts has been two of them. First of all, because there is no limit and no control of the expenses that can be claimed by the oil giant, when they are declaring and paying royalties and remittances based on profit, percentage of profit, we have no way, even, even if we had full access to all their financial information, even if we had the capacity to assimilate it and process it, we have no way to control that question of expenses so as to determine a realistic net profit or, or whether expenses are being um, are being exaggerated or being incurred unnecessarily. I think we needed to have some basement royalties that we knew were guaranteed in any event. We haven't done that. Too bad. The other thing that bothered me was safety, the environment. For some reason, I see that there is no provision if there is an environmental disaster, an oil spill, a leak, anything, for the oil giant to deal with it. Under the terms as I saw, the oil giant reports it to our CDC, and our CDC deals with it. Now, the couple canoes and small boats that the Guyana Coast Guard and the CDC have, not going to go and deal with any serious problem. So I think that we were poorly advised and it was not well thought out. To, we needed to ensure that there were indemnities offered by the oil giant. There were timelines for fixing any problems. There were penalties that were tied to profit. You see, we saw we saw recently in the news, the EPA said that there's an oil spill and they find the giant couple of peanuts. There needs to be a transparent system where everybody understands what's going on. And it isn't solved by EPA imposing some fine. Because the fact is EPA doesn't know there's an oil spill unless X1 comes to tell us. Because we don't even have the infrastructure or the way with all to go and police it. We are relying on their goodwill, on their honesty, and pretending that we're enforcing some kind of police powers. I think we got to recognize where the real ability is, where the real infrastructure is, and make use of that by imposing contractual obligations on the giant to fix the leaks, to indemnify us against loss, to give us guarantees, rather than this arrangement where they simply tell us and, and it's our problem, especially since we don't have the capacity to deal with it. So there are a couple issues like that, but again, that is not said as a criticism of the new government because I don't think they had a choice. At the time, it had been negotiated. The foreign investor expected and had an expectation that the, there would be progress in how the licenses were issued, how the exploration was done, timelines would be met. And you cannot say to the foreign investor, given the size of the investment and, the, and what's going forward, too bad, we changed our minds. So I, I don't know that there was that much flexibility going forward. I think that from now, we have to try to make sure that we do our side of it better and that we control what we can, but we ensure we are protected contractually in the event of things going all right. Uh, can I make a point here, Asha? Uh, 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 I, uh, on, professor, go ahead. Yeah, on what uh, was just said, uh, I'm in agreement with what was just said. However, I want to point out something. You see all the oil companies in the world, the OPEC countries, there was a time when they were in the same situation that Guyana is in now. Uh, all the points which were pointed out by Jonas are correct. Do, we don't have the information. We depend on the oil companies. In the OPEC countries, which was all the oil companies from the Middle East and all about, they started off with very limited knowledge about the oil industry. It took years and years before they developed uh, expertise and knowledge. So we are going to have a continuous problem in the oil company state relations in Guyana and how we could be able to squeeze more and more out of the oil companies, more and more. And this, we have had some experience with bauxite. This we have had uh, experience with sugar. 
it's fundamentally not a very different relation between the transnational corporation and the state. But in the specific case of oil, we have to fast track a bit, one way or the other, to put together a team of people with the technical know-how about the oil industry. Not newspaper articles that are ideological, political, like I have three or four years we paid the Institute for somebody to collect all the articles in the newspaper uh, or the three major, the major newspapers in Ghana about oil and gas. And when I, I'm doing a content analysis and there is no real knowledge of the industry, it's a conversation in the public square with um, a discussion that is quite superficial. So we really need, uh, we knew a lot about sugar because we started with it from slavery to now. We knew about rice. Bauxite was not so difficult to grasp and put our arms around it. And we were able to bring to the bauxite industry over the years a number of people that had some degree of qualification. But oil is going to be a bigger challenge. And the other problem with oil, why it's a bigger challenge, is that oil now is being developed in the sea, in the Atlantic, inaccessible, of extremely high level of technology. So these are challenges. But what I would advise the government is that as they go along, be transparent, be open with the people of Guyana. Tell them what the reality is. What are the hurdles they are facing? You see, the problem with a government is if they do not share. You know, I don't agree with the ideology of Fidel Castro. But one of the things I like about him, whenever he had a major issue to deal with, whether it was a crisis or that, he mobilized all the masses of Cuba. I talk to them for seven hours and tell them everything. In other words, if the people are informed, they will understand. The Guyanese people are going to be on the side of any government that was democratically elected like this government. But you have to tell them what is going on. So I think transparency is important. Accountability is important. But I think uh, as we deal with that, we have to think of the era that we are living in. You know, I don't want to sound very philosophical, but I designed a course called Global Politics in the Era of Trump because I teach US foreign policy. Now, I, I'm doing a different lecture, Global Politics in the Era of COVID. Now, COVID has consumed Trump. It has consumed the president of uh, China, the president of Russia. It is no longer about, it's not the era of Trump, it's the era of COVID. Now, now, Guyana right now is in the middle of COVID. And I think this is very important that in this respect, COVID has done to something to us philosophically that we can't even think sometimes about the past or the future. We have to think about the now. Because you and I, the three of us don't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow morning. Have you ever experienced something like that in your life? We can't even plan for the next 2025. And you can't be caught up in the past, it's the now. So I think one of the major issues that this government is going to have to deal with, and I wish them the best on it because it's, it's not going to be easy, is how they deal with the now. People right now want jobs now. They want health care now. But you know what is also very important? because this is life and death, is that the government has to challenge, do not walk in the mistakes of previous governments, of telling the people, making them believe that the government has the answer for everything. Let's take COVID. You have to wear a mask. You have to keep your distance. And you have to wash your hands. No, the government can't do that for you. You have to do it for yourself. We have a big problem here in America. So I think that whether it's the oil industry, whatever it is, the government has to issue a daily challenge. Wake up 5.30 in the morning, speak to the nation, remind them what are their responsibility in helping for us to deal with this issue. Because I think the most serious problem we are facing there right now, you know, the three of us could list about 20 things that has to be done in Guyana. 
But right now, the now is COVID. And with that, we have to see how the oil resources that are going to come in are going to be accountable and how it's going to be used. You know, I like to go to examples of that is a bit anecdotal, but they tell you stories. In the 1970s, and every time I went to a country, at the airport, I'll pick up a newspaper and read it on my way. So on my way to Caracas, I'm reading the newspaper. Lo and behold, the banks of Switzerland offered Carlos Andres Perez, the then president of Venezuela, millions and millions of dollars of loans. Now, our government have got to be careful with that. You cannot have an oil industry earning a lot of income from it and at the same time taking a lot of loans. And I was happy to see that in the launching of the manifesto of the PPP, that the former president, Jack Dale, made that point, that you have to be careful with the taking of loans. Because these bankers come to you, you have a lot of money, so they want to lend you money. Why, why do you have to borrow money when you are having an in income stream that is significant and sizable? That is what led to corruption, and eventually Carlos Sanders Perez was impeached uh, about corruption. So these are the kind of things we have to avoid, that we don't move from Bocas Guyana to Exxon Guyana, that we understand that it's a very difficult time for this government in the sense that they cannot deal with the past or the future. They have to deal with the now because of COVID. And um, a lot of the manifesto that they have may have to be re-engineered in the context of this reality. Now we are opening up the airport. Let's see what will happen and what the impact will be. That has to be monitored very, very carefully. So I think it's a good subject of us looking into uh, implementing programs. But I would say that the major thing is we have to, I am not in government, you are not in government. Uh, you share governance in the sense that you all have a representation in parliament and so forth. But we have to study what the PPP manifesto, C manifesto promised and how you can keep their feet to the fire. But we have to do it in, an, in the context of the COVID crisis that is facing not only Guyana, but the world. And the last, last point I want to make about the oil industry and the state of Guyana, whichever government is there, is that we are, from the developing countries are in a perpetual struggle for what we call policy space. How can we have enough space to address and respond to the needs of our people rather than the needs of external forces and international institutions. That depends a lot on how we use our brains, how we are prepared, how much we're willing to study and, and, uh, uh, and come up with ideas, creative ideas on how we can create policy space. Because if we depend on these external forces and their think tanks and their thinkers, they will squeeze every ounce out of us. All right, thank you, Professor. Mr. Jonas, I know you have a few responses. I can see your reaction be before you go on. I'd like to remind the audience that we are opposition. Myself, Asha Kisun, and Mr. Timothy Jonas sitting here. We are in government, we are opposition. In the shared governance or inclusive governance system, we have noticed that there's synergy between our manifestos. We have a roadmap to prosperity. They have a plan for prosperity. And the reason we supported them is because we see a lot of synergy in the things they have set out to do. And I've been saying it from the beginning that we can only build Guyana together, be it opposition, be it current government, be it small party, be it old party, whoever it is, we must come together as a people to build Guyana. You brought up interesting points. So before we go on, Ms. Jonas, I'll give you a chance to respond if there's anything that um, popped out while Professor was speaking. Well, I, I smiled when Paul said he doesn't know if we're going to wake up tomorrow. <laughs> Sorry, do I, I plan to wake up tomorrow. I, I hope I got some time left. I think that um, when I was listening to you speak, and, and please understand, I don't say this critically, but I say this as um, a result of my own experience 
in speaking with academics and then in the course of my practice speaking with businessmen and, and folks in, in um, industry, at the political level and the academic level, we tend to get a little too distant for my liking from the practical nitty gritties of money and of making money and of the how the economics of the country runs. We what happens is we end up discussing a lot of things that sound nice, but turn out to be pipe dreams because we don't seem to make the connection between a wish and a hard plan. So we talk about local content and that sounds wonderful, local content. But if we get down to the nitty gritty of local content in the context of oil and gas, we immediately run into problems. Um, last week on this show, you, you had two experts who spoke very informatively about the oil and gas industry in Guyana and its similarities and differences from Venezuela, Trinidad and, and elsewhere. And one of the points that came home to me that I, I keep making and, and would like to say again, there is no oil and gas in Guyana. The oil and gas is offshore, many miles offshore. It hasn't come here. What happens is that they've built a large floating platform in another country that they are bringing to a place many miles offshore. They are employing specialized, highly specialized engineers and folk on that platform to extract oil, to inject gas back into the area where they extracted the oil from to maintain the high pressure so that more oil comes out, to fill up the ships with that oil and to take the ships to refineries outside. None of that's coming here. So in terms of the question of who is being employed, there are not very many Guyanese who have a clue as to what's going on on that floating platform, who have any experience in terms of the engineering involved, the policies involved, even with the satellite companies that have come in to offer services to ExxonMobil. So the, the people who sell the pipes, because you need pipes when you're drilling, you, you run pipes in and the pipes are kind of a telescopic pipe. You run a large one in and then you pull out the middle one and you're left with a hollow structure, that kind of thing. Things that I only know vaguely about, but it's highly specialized, highly regulated, highly regimented, and needs to be done on a continuous basis with a reliable supply. The sludge that comes out from that 12 inch or, and it narrows down to, to, at some points to six inch pipe, the mud and the muck and the bricks and the rock that comes out, doesn't just get dumped into the sea. It has to be disposed of in a way that is environmentally friendly. We talk about flaring gas and I hear about plans for somehow, by some magic means, bringing this gas to land to reconfigure all our electrical generation equipment so that suddenly now it can use this gas to generate electricity cheaply for everybody. All of these things sound nice, but they all need very specific nitty gritty plans on a step by step basis so that we see if this thing is feasible, if it's going to make money or if it makes any sense for us or if we're just making nice sounding noises like let's eradicate poverty and give a million dollars to every guy and his um, adult. Either we have a plan that works or we can go off into the fancy, but that fancy sounding, um, nice sounding sound bites like local content and, and this and that. I think we have to be cautious when we go down that road, unless it makes sense to us how this thing is going to happen, we shouldn't blindly buy into it. One example I'd like to give is the mistake we make pretending that a good thing is happening when we get a $25,000 check. Taxes are reduced more money is to be spent on infrastructure and we don't even ask ourselves well, how is this happening how do taxes go down but infrastructure spending go up education spending go up how is all of this happening that's that creates a deficit that is economically any housewife will tell you that is economically impossible your expenditure doesn't go up at the same time that your only source of revenue goes down so why are we blindly saying oh these are good things 
and not asking ourselves, well, what is the nitty gritty to make this work? Paul talked about borrowing money. At a national level, it's not always bad to borrow money because I can see, and I don't, I don't know if this is what the government is planning, but if they are, they would have my support, that if they have a future expectation of oil revenue increasing um, exponentially over the next few years, that is something they can borrow against for immediate infrastructural spending, because that same infrastructural spending will create employment. If that is the plan, go. But say to the people what you're doing, because it's all well and good to say we've reduced VAT and we've also increased your salary. But when I hear that, I hear magic. And I want to know how it happened. And I think that we need to be informed how it happened. We need to be transparent. Our systems need to be transparent. Our government needs to be transparent. And unless that happens, we will fall on the rocky road of corruption. And that is my big concern. That is my big worry. That Thank point, you, Mr. Chair. Yeah. That has been a concern of a lot of people that have reached out to me um, over the past few weeks, and I'm happy that you brought it up. Professor, I'll give you a chance to respond because I know you have something to say there. Please yeah, go ahead. Well, the, let's say this. Um, it is understood, and I've looked at uh, the presentation of the PPPC manifesto, that they are aware about, because both the president and uh, the vice president, former ja President Jack Hill, are very good economists. They know about economics. So they are aware about the, the what we call macroeconomics, that, you know, you, you have to have growth, but it can't be growth without development and growth without jobs. Then, you know, it's of no use to the Guyanese people. But they will have to borrow in the short term. And I agree with, with Jonas. They will have to borrow in in terms of the anticipated revenues, but they will have to borrow in the short term. And I agree, and I've said that, that whatever they do, what they have to do is to be to square it up with the people, be transparent and tell them this what you're doing. Now the question is whether, and this has been the story of all the oil, oil developing countries that have oil. Are you going to use the resources to transform the economy or are you going to use the resources to just uh, just oiling a machine, a bureaucratic machine uh, that will, um, if the oil revenues come short or there's a world crisis, you're in trouble. Um, so the point is that accompanying a, a, a policy about gas and oil taking into consideration all the realities that Jonas mentioned, and that I also have mentioned that in the history of the OPEC countries, they did not acquire knowledge about the oil industry, and I'm speaking of technical knowledge, overnight. It's a process, and it's a very difficult task. But what I'm saying is that when oil revenues do come into the country, and the Treasury has a lot of money I am not advising that any government should go and continue borrowing because what happens is that the bankers abroad are only thinking of making money. It's like the Asian crisis we had. It's like the mortgage crisis we had over here, 1998 and 2006. So I think if we are going to learn from the lessons of other countries, that is one of the major lessons that while oil revenues is coming into the country, do not borrow. But I agree, in this time period, the next six months, the next year, the government will have to borrow because Jonas is right. They cannot subsidize, they cannot lower taxes while the private sector is not expanding at the same time. And we are hoping, when you, at least how I understand local content, is that the income we will get from oil will be plowed into the national economy, whether it is to help the rights industry to become transformational, the forest industry to become transformational, the gold industry, the bauxite industry, all the sectors that we have, how could the resources that we will get from oil, and of course, probably equally important to, as Jonas want to be real, 
we have to have a successful hydroelectric project, non-renewable energy that can begin to be put in place. Because that is the only way we will guarantee households and the private sector a cheap electricity. And you cannot develop a country without a low electricity bill. Energy is vital. And we are not going to get it in the short term from oil. Because he just explained the problems of tubes and, uh, you know, look how many years it took Euro, uh, Russia to be putting these um, pipelines all across Europe to be able to give them gas and oil. So, and these people are highly developed countries. And look where we are at. So these are very good points that uh, are, have been raised. You guys are there. You are in the government. But what I would like to salute, number one, is the tremendous contribution you all have made for us to have free and fair elections. Uh, and number two, the very uh, uh, matured and patriotic way in which you are approaching governance in this in the last 100 days with regard to the present government. Um, I think that uh, the governments should recognize uh, the kind of patriotism and maturity and be able to engage you all in constructive criticism. You know, I met Mr. Jagdeo, uh, pre former President Jagdeo, in March, and he seemed to me very open. And I talked to him about policies. He said, listen, if you all have ideas about policies, we are willing to discuss them. We are willing to debate them. And if they make sense, we are willing to incorporate them. I think if they keep that spirit with the opposition, unfortunately, we don't have the full opposition uh, in place as yet. And I hope that that will happen uh, uh, as soon as possible so that you could have a full house a United Guyanese working on, on, on this. But, you know, beyond oil and gas and beyond the ideas about taxes and, and so forth, uh, we have a number of issues that is still burning issues that was in the PNC, man, uh, the PPPC manifest, governance, national security. How do we deal with crime? How do we deal with the race issue? How do we do deal with GCOM? You know, all these issues are interrelated because you can't separate one from the other. This is reality. Uh, we have a major health crisis linked with all these issues. So uh, I believe uh, that uh, we could move forward if the current government continues and you all in the opposition can create an enabling environment for the common Guyanese grassroots people to participate in, um, in the debate and the discussion about how the country moves forward. All right. Thank you, Professor. We had a lively discussion so far and see that it ended on the use of oil funds. Let me quote to the audience. Um, something quickly about how the government plans to use the oil money or handle it in the sense of speaking in a common man's term. They said that they are going to define by legislation how funds will flow from the sovereign wealth fund into the budget and the purpose for which they will be used. And what they intend to do ultimately is establish an arms length sovereign wealth fund insulated from political interference which goes back to what both of you gentlemen had say had said earlier is that we need the experts getting in so let us take a quick break to the audience we will be back soon and we'll continue this lovely discussion that we're having travel span is pleased to announce that the airport in guyana is now open there are flights from new york and miami non-stop to guyana call travel span for all your travel needs to guyana or for your vacation to Mexico or Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Flights are now on sale to Guyana and vacation packages are now on sale to Mexico and Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437.
Logistics International based in Trinidad, with representatives in Guyana, is pleased to announce its shipping services from Trinidad to Guyana. Logistics provides shipping services and has experienced personnel to handle all of your shipping needs from Trinidad to Guyana. Buy in Trinidad and let Logistics handle all of your shipping to Guyana from small boxes to container sizes. Call Logistics in Trinidad at 1-868-336-8218 to handle all of your shipping needs and they handle all sizes. Logistics International has been shipping for over 22 years to many Caribbean countries with reliability and dependability. Call 1-868-336-8218 in Trinidad. That's 1-868-336-8218. Or email at liclcargo at gmail.com. Welcome back everyone to Globespan 24-7. Tonight we have been speaking about the implementation to the of the plan to prosperity, basically the government's manifesto. Things we like about it, things we do not like, and where improvements can be made because ultimately we want to see Guyana become the best that it can be. Um, as we have been discussing, we spoke about a little bit on the impact of COVID-19 on the economy, on the people of Guyana, and on the working people since March when we had our first case to know. Um, today, it so happens the Public Service Union put out a press release speaking about their health care workers and that they should be considered frontline, all of them. We have seen protests from the health staff from on the streets. We have seen strikes in hospitals and health centers. Uh, Mr. Jonas, as you're here, let me start with you. What's your overall opinion of the state in which the health workers have been um, treated and their response to it. Do you believe the protesting is getting them anywhere? Is there a better way of handling it? What's your take on the situation? That's an unhappy state of affairs. Look, there, there are three areas of endeavor <clears throat> that are underappreciated and the compensation packages need to double and triple and the incentives for education in those three fields of endeavor need to be enormous. Police, teachers, nurses, they are the lifeblood of the society and they are underappreciated. Now, we talk about frontline, but the frontline isn't just the nurses. When you look at those police out on the road doing their jobs, they are interacting with mm -hmm. all and sundry. They don't get to stay in their offices and hide. The teachers have been protected. And again, um, this is one area I would like to offer support to Ms. Manik Chan. I think she's done a good job in arranging the public schooling so the children have access to their teachers and classes are going on. I have two children who are of school age and I see it happening and I like it. I know that communities have come together nicely to offer internet access to a neighbor who might afford it or to share a computer with a neighbor's child. Um, you hear about those stories and that is very important. It, it shows that we're still a village. We're still a community in a meaningful way. So. Where the teachers are concerned, maybe they are not frontline, but I don't want them to be left out of this conversation. The ugly reality that we have to acknowledge in Guyana today is that those three areas of endeavor are by and large peopled by APNU supporters. And therefore, they are in a situation where they are looking at the government that they did not support, they do not support, and they are therefore much more likely to be disruptive than they would have been. It's an irony, actually, because it was under APNU that police lost their yearly bonus. Um, it was under APNU that the ministry refused even to engage the teachers union when they had this, when they wanted to have discussions about salary wages, salary increases. But none of that matters in our sad society. Where we are now is in a situation where our nurses, who are our 
lifeline who are so important to the society and have always been underpaid, they need a better situation. And if so much can be spent reducing taxes, reducing VAT for wealthy people who can afford it, certainly something can be spent to help the nurses, the teachers and the police. I would prefer the government to say we're keeping the taxes a little longer so we can afford to pay these people more because these are the grassroots people that Paul's talking about. These are the people who are there in numbers, who need our protection and need to see that they have our respect. Right now, they don't. And well, something needs to be done about that. I endorse fully what uh, Jonas has just said. I just like to make a, a comment and to compliment what he has said. My comment is that right here in the capital, the political capital of the world, the United States of America, Washington, D.C., and the U.S., we face exactly the same problems with those three groups of people, the frontline healthcare workers, the teachers, and the police. If you look at America today, they are in the center, the very center of this debate. And as a teacher who's teaching online and with a grandson who is 10 years old, I am very aware, and with my students, uh, what he said there, you wouldn't believe. I live in Ward 7 in Washington, D.C. It's one of the poorest uh, wards in the United States of America. My students are predominantly Afro, and they are single mothers, and I am teaching them by computer. And some of them do not have computer. The university has provided them with one. So I am, that's, a, that's a thing that has happened in the world today, that whether you're in the Guyana, the second poorest country in the hemisphere, or the richest country of the world. Can you believe it? We face the same problems, and we should ask ourselves, why? Why? This world order is in trouble. But I want, as a person with uh, a very long labor background in the hemisphere and the world, that there has to be, I know Patrick Yard, I know the Public Service Union, and I know the history of the TUC, they have got to come out of the time warp of yesterday and deal with the now. You cannot have a trade union movement that is hostile to a government because of previous politics. This is in the middle of COVID. So, you know, in labor, and I'm glad they restored the minister, Ministry of Labor, we call it tripartite. You have the government, you have the labor movement and the private sector. You have to work as a team. The International Labor Organization in Geneva encouraged them to do that, that they have to work as a team. I think Lincoln Lewis, Patrick Yard and these guys have got to jump off of the horse of yesterday. Do not be part of the insurrection politics. It's over. It's over and begin to have a dialogue. I'll also call on the Minister of Labor, who I am sure is disposed to engage in a dialogue. This problem of the teachers, the nurses and the police cannot be dealt with only with the government. They have to sit and they have to deal with it. And in terms of where we get the money for this, I think the government, uh, from what I read as advertised, for a loan. Um, they need that loan and they need it yesterday. And as soon as they get that loan, I think these three sectors should be given priority. The other problem we have that has to be given priority is the rise of crime, which evidently occurs. And every day I open the newspaper and I look, I see it's young people, the youth, who is in trouble with this crime problem. People are victims. Families are victims, but at the same time, these young people are victims, and um, there is a need to address them also. Uh, we, we have to rescue them from seeing the only way of survival is to go and commit a crime to survive, because I think that's what they're doing it, apart from the extreme cases of people who have addictions, and they're in gangs, and this kind of thing. But I'm speaking uh, generally that this is another issue we have to deal with. But I endorse totally. But I'm saying that the trade union movement, the TUC cannot, cannot. And the head of the TUC, 
is a friend of mine and uh, uh, he has to get out of that horse that he's in. Patrick Yard also has to get out of that horse. If you're representing the workers, you have to represent their best interest. And trade union movement is not a political party. It is not there to expose, oppose and, re uh, and remove a government. It is there to make sure that you have proper labor laws that are respected and that the workers' wages and conditions of work are respected. And that's your priority. Let the political opposition deal with their, their agenda and you have to deal with the interests of the workers because this is very important. All right, thank you, gentlemen. I have seen a lot of efforts from the side of the government to engage with the people who are protesting to bargain. It's mentioned in their manifesto that they would reestablish the Ministry of Labor and strengthen capabilities of the ministry to address industrial disputes, including issues of collective bargaining. I know that there was a group who met with um, Honorable Jennifer Westford. There were some discussions. We are yet to know what the outcome will be, but yes, we can collectively agree that more needs to be done for our people. There are efforts being made, so I am also sitting and waiting to see what is going to happen next. OK, so we have touched COVID. We have touched our oil and gas industry. Um, something I would like to bring up tonight. It's a pity Mr. Schumann is not with us. He had a death in the family. Our sincere condolences to him. I wanted to speak a bit about the Amerindian community. There's COVID. They are heavily impacted at the moment. They have always been a bit a step behind of the rest of the population in Guyana. Um, in your opinion, let's start with you, Professor. In your opinion, what more could be done for our indigenous population right now to help them through this time? Ghana is about to go on a growth spurt, yes, but we also have the challenges of COVID going side by side with it. Is enough being done for our Amerindian population? Well, Historically, Amerindians have always been marginalized. And um, I think uh, the sense I got from the current government is that they are going to prioritize it. And I listened to Schumann's maiden speech in parliament, and I was very impressed. He is a voice for the Amerindian people in as much, I think he has become a national voice, but he is a voice and he outlaid a whole plan a whole uh, a number of uh, immediate uh, demands that the Amerindian community has. But we have to ensure that the Amerindian community is not decimated like the colonial times when um, diseases were brought from Europe and it eliminated an entire uh, uh, thousands and thousands of, of people all across the Americas, Native American people. Now. So therefore, I, I agree with you that it has to be prioritized. Um, and um, we had a lot of investment in the past. I don't know if the previous government had continued it. You are a medical doctor. You studied in Cuba. Quite a few Amerindians were, Amerindian people were, were given opportunities to become doctors. Isn't that a fact? Uh, Asha, is, Dr. Asha, is not a fact that Amerindian a few, but yes, yeah. we had Amerindian students there with us. OK, so that needs to be fast tracked. Um, we need more Amerindian people in, in the community. Um, we, we need a lot more medical personnel from the very Amerindian community because it might be difficult to get people to come from the coast to go down there. So they have to be, you know, this is a crisis that's going to require crash programs. Uh, nurses. Nurses are very important. I believe that we could employ hundreds of nurses in the Amerindian community. You're a medical doctor. You should know that more than I do, but they could be trained within six months and produce a lot in each community, a number of nurses, both male nurses and female nurses. Uh, we wouldn't have the time uh, while some of them will have scholarship but that for medicine, but that takes a, a longer time. But they okay. uh, just just before you continue, what you're speaking of is community health workers. 
for the six months because nursing programs take a couple of years okay. and it's an intense, complete um, syllabus and system to get a nurse into a hospital situation. But six months is a community health worker. Well, do you agree that we have uh, in Guyana enough uh, qualified people who could train these people within uh, six months to help to alleviate in the short term? the impact that COVID oh, is having? Oh, yes, definitely. For health and alleviation, yes. So, Asha, yes. that's something that you probably could advance um, from your uh, experience as a doctor. You know, I'm not an expert on that, but in terms of policy, I think about it, and I've been thinking about it, how there could be a rapid response. The other uh, th uh, point that is very important, uh, you know, and this is difficult, uh, two or three generations live in the same household in the Amerindian community. And this COVID is, uh, moves and destroys an entire family. So that's another issue that will have to be addressed. It's, it's not, uh, you know, but the immediate, I think, is that we could train six months in each community. We could train a number of nurses, male and female, young people to address in the short term, in the immediate, uh, this issue in the Amerindian community, apart from the larger issues that they have? Well, I can say that there is training being done. They've been asking for volunteers, but there aren't enough incentives to attract these people okay. from those communities. I agree. Even we go back health, to what? Right we go, now, I we, speak to my colleagues. I speak to my colleagues, they're burnt out. There are three doctors to 200 patients in one yep. region. There are some critical patients. The payment is terrible. Um, some areas are very unsafe. The ones close to the border where there's shooting and piracy happening, people's lives are at risk. They also have families at home. They're facing their own challenges. I, as a mother, when I come home, my child would normally run to me every day and hug me up. Now when I get home, he stands at the step and he looks at me because he understands I can't touch mommy. She came from a COVID, um, possible COVID infected area. So it's just not just the workers in the direct field there, but everybody It goes the same for the police officer out there, the security guard, the port at the hospital, the lab technician, everybody is feeling that burden. Yeah, the era of COVID is the eve of COVID, but you raised it in terms of the Amerindians, and there is no doubt that the poorer you are in Guy, we are the second poorest in the hemisphere. So they, there's an overall thing there that we are all mostly poor. So we all have a common problem, but hey, among the poor, there is also the poorest. And um, there's no doubt Amerindians and rural populations are more marginalized. And, uh, you know, and in the urban areas, in this, um, some of the neighborhoods are really in a bad state too. So, but I think the Amerindians uh, have now got a voice in parliament and we depend on Schumann, uh, you know, to, to be a voice there, a very strong voice. Plus they have a minister of Amerindian affairs. Um, and we go back to keeping, uh, trying the best to keep whoever is in office, their feet to the fire, you know. But as everybody says, if you don't speak for yourself, nobody's going to speak for you. That's how life is, you know. You have to speak all the time for yourself. You, 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 you have to have voices to speak for you. And uh, you guys uh, have been doing that. And, uh, and that's wonderful, you know, uh, that you all are doing that. Thank you. Timothy, please go ahead. The, the Amerindian issue needs an honest and frank discussion. Um, I grew up in a household that had some exposure in that regard. So there are a couple of things I am aware of. For example, um, scholarships are sometimes offered to Amerindian children in the interior and they are put up at, you can call them halfway houses. It might either be a hostel or hostel. It, would be, it would be the home of a family who makes a room available and they're incorporated as part of the family, almost a foster arrangement. Um, it sounds nice on the face of it, but there are serious insensitivities and oppression going on. The, 
the government has a tradition. Every guy is, is familiar with the site of some government function, and you've got a parade of half-naked Armenian youth dancing, supposedly some cultural event. What they don't know, the ugliness behind that, is that these so-called privileged children who have been brought out of the interior for this education, it is expected of them that they turn up and they do this as, as part of the show, as part of the routine um, of, of giving back. So even in that system, there's oppression. The other aspect that we don't talk about um, is that we like to say oh, that we, we have to keep the, the interior pristine and we have to respect the traditions and the mores of, of the communities that are there, those communities that were here long before Christopher Columbus came. But there's also another reality. The other reality is that in those same communities, often there's the same oppression, there's the same um, sexual predation on, on the girls and the women, um, not just by soldiers, police, miners, foreigners that come in and um, exploit the vulnerability, but often by people in the community itself. Um, so that needs to be looked at. And then we talk about, and, and Paul has asked you about Amerindians who have been lucky to come out and receive an education and become a professional in whatever field of endeavor. You know about doctors, Lennox himself is a pilot. How many of them voluntarily go back where they came from? and live in a location without electricity, catching fish and drying cassava to make a living on a day-by-day -day struggle basis. We sit here comfortably in our air conditioning with our electricity and talk about how wonderful that culture is. But when you go in Haruni and you go in those areas, Kato in those places, the people there want to come out here. They want the good life. And we are not making that connection. This is why I, I keep talking about these highfalutin, nice concepts about, about you know, 100 years ago, they called it the noble savage, about, um, you know, the culture of the, of the Amerindians and respecting the culture and ensuring that they can maintain their culture. 80% of them don't want that culture. When you speak to an Amerindian and he comes out and he sees what is possible, his idea of wealth, he wants it. So we have to find a connection where the Amerindian who is happy and um, engaging in agriculture, living the lifestyle that he's accustomed to in the interior, is able to do so and has access to health, education, the, the needs that, that will allow him to live a first class life. But also the Amerindian that doesn't want that that wants an opportunity to come out. He must have that access. And the way to do that is roads, education, making it movement easy. And we have not done that. And we keep making promises. And every time a political party goes in the interior to give some ATV to a village or some outboard motor to a favorite to show, all they are doing is perpetuating the the subservience of these people and their dependence on these handouts. So you go and you do that for some votes, you don't go back for five years and you perpetuate the poverty, you perpetuate the desperation and you don't help. So either we deal with it properly or we need to stop talking about it. But we can't pretend that we like them in there because it's all noble and wonderful. When we know full well that the, the our own friends that we know who have come out, who are doctors and professionals, they're not going back in there. I am aware of many, many of the um, youngsters who have come out and have gotten lucky and have gotten degrees, have gotten masters, migrated, never looking back. Yeah. And I would challenge anybody to point me to a professionally tertiary level educated Amerindian who originated in one of those places or Riala, wherever you want to go, and says, here I am with my PhD, I'm now going back there in the bush to live. But You've got to make opportunities available. <laughs> Jonas, um, we could take that to another level. We had the highest per capita of exodus of Guyanese who are tertiary educated coming abroad 
to the developed countries are not going back either. So, so, so we have that dilemma. But one of the things I observe traveling through Guyana is that Amerindians are voting with their feet. I go to Canal Number One, for example, and I find that a lot of the homes, the people are abroad, and who are living in those homes now, renting them, Amerindians. So you are right, Jonas. Amerindians are moving because. If the benefits are not getting to them and opportunities, they have to they have to migrate, and there have been a pattern of increasing migration. It might not be uh, extraordinary, but I have observe, observed that it's been happening, and Canal Number One is an example of that. What you see is you see them. You see a lot of Armenians that are employed in timber, in mining, near the Brazil border, they go over the border um, and take up employment in agriculture over there. Um, if that isn't happening, then it is a very basic subsistence level of existence and you got to be young and able-bodied. So it's not a good, it's not a good place to be getting no. old and, and frail. Exactly. We, we have to try to improve on that. Uncle gentlemen, we'll go on our second break now and then we'll get back right into it. To the audience, please stay tuned. Cannot travel due to COVID? Then treat yourself or your loved one with a gift. Purchase it online, then let Travelspan Shop and Ship take care of the rest. Travelspan is now offering a Shop and Ship program to Guyana and Trinidad. Cheap rates plus tracking and multiple offices in Georgetown, West Coast Demerara and Berbice to take care of your package. Treat yourself and ship your Christmas gifts early this year. In Guyana, 227-1701. And in New York, call 347-238-2201. That's 227-1701. And in New York, 347-238-2201. Let Travelspan and Globespan take care of your online shopping and shipping. Travelspan is pleased to announce that the airport in Guyana is now open. There are flights from New York and Miami non-stop to Guyana. Call Travelspan for all your travel needs to Guyana or for your vacation to Mexico or Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437. That's 718-845-0437. Flights are now on sale to Guyana and vacation packages are now on sale to Mexico and Punta Cana. Call 718-845-0437. Logistics International, based in Trinidad, with representatives in Guyana, is pleased to announce its shipping services from Trinidad to Guyana. Logistics provides shipping services and has experienced personnel to handle all of your shipping needs from Trinidad to Guyana. Buy in Trinidad and let Logistics handle all of your shipping to Guyana, from small boxes to container sizes. Call Logistics in Trinidad at 1-868-336-8218 to handle all of your shipping needs and they handle all sizes. Logistics International has been shipping for over 22 years to many Caribbean countries with reliability and dependability. Call 1-868-336-8218 in Trinidad. That's 1-868-336-8218 or email at liclcargo at gmail.com. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Globespan 24-7. I've had the pleasure of being in the company of these two extraordinary gentlemen who have taken their time to be with us tonight and speak about current issues. Our topic tonight was the implementation of the Plan to Prosperity. Gentlemen, all good things do come to an end, so we're very close to the ending of the program tonight. So I'll invite you now to give your closing comments and to touch on anything that you felt was important and you would like to say to the audience tonight. Professor Tennessee, I'll start with you, please. Well, what I would like to say that is that, and I salute you all, both of you and Schumann if he was here and the leadership in the PPPC. I salute the international solidarity that we received from over 130 countries for verifiable free and fair elections. I think uh, Guyana is still on a very shaky foot in terms of institutionalizing democracy. Free and fair election is, the, is, is, is a strategic first step, but it's not the end all and be all. 
Um, I look forward that this government uh, will carry out uh, the manifesto. They did a lot of consultation on the issue of governance, national security, balancing the well-being of Guyanese, economic growth, jobs, and all that. And um, what we have to do as Guyanese, both at home and abroad, and the government has said they intend to uh, uh, work with Guyanese abroad also, because Guyanese have contributed in the past significantly with remittances that has helped Guyana a lot, um, and in more ways than one. So I look forward that um, and hope and pray that the opposition will begin to go back to parliament and behave the way your parties are behaving um, in this era of COVID, which is existential. I hope the trade union council and the labor movement in general will uh, take a new approach in dealing with governance in Guyana in, in this short term, at least medium term, in the interest of all Guyanese. And um, I look forward to coming in November to see both of you uh, <laughs> and to see what is happening in Guyana on the ground. So I am optimistic, I am hopeful, and I'm prayer prayerfully hoping that our country will make some real giant steps forward. That is what I'd like to say. Thank you. Mr. Jonas, can we please have your um, thoughts and closing comments? This plan for prosperity that, that um, was published by the PPPC government, there is a lot of good, but in my view, there are too many pipe dreams and not enough solid policies and plans. The one item there that I thought was far and away the best had to do with the development of infrastructure insofar as road building was concerned. I see there are plans for roads to Rockstone, Bartica. Um, the Brazil road is being planned. A bridge over the Quarantine River is already, there's already talks with the Surinamese about that. I had already, I had previously touted the suggestion and I'll write something in the papers about it, that I would have preferred to see a tunnel under the Demara River rather than a high rise bridge over the Demara River. Um, it was actually proposed in a um, access to Georgetown report back in 1970, before the Demara Harbor Bridge was built. And when I read it, it sounded revolutionary and absolutely surprising. But the more I read about it and having spoken to engineers on the subject, it made much more sense. A boat cannot run into a tunnel. Even if you have a high rise, granted you don't have to open that bridge to let boats pass, but if a boat slips its anchor, it can run into that same high rise, it can run into the, the post, the, the pillions and cause damage. A boat can't run into a tunnel that goes under the river and there therefore is no restraint, no restriction on river traffic and there is no doubt river traffic is going to increase exponentially over the next few years as the service to the oil and gas fields increases and as the access further upriver, linden and agriculture increase, um, timber coming out increases. So we, we need to make sure that river traffic is moves freely but I like the road building and I like the idea that previously inaccessible places are becoming accessible. As you know, my bugbear is corruption, secrecy. You cannot have a system where the decision making power rests with the minister, where he has all the say. One of the largest criticisms that had been made of the previous petroleum bill was that the power centered in the minister. He had the power to award the contracts. He had the power to sell the blocks. He had the power to negotiate and do these things unilaterally. That leads to problems. I'd like to point out that where power rests with the minister, with the government functionary in financial matters, and there is no oversight and there's no scrutiny by the opposition, you will have corruption. You will have the appearance of corruption. You cannot rely on the halo 
that your leaders have because your leaders do not wear halos, they're not angels. Now, during the course of the last week, a PPP minister was accused of directing business to some company that his son had an interest in and it created a brouhaha. Whether it was true or not doesn't bother me. I, um, either it was or it wasn't, I don't know. But here is one thing that bothered me about that whole incident. The minister wrote to the media to protest at the accusation that's been made against him. And his response was in two areas. First of all, he said that he had given instructions that the contract was not to proceed, so that some other entity was to be awarded the contract. And second, he blamed an APNU PNC official who works in that ministry for making the accusation. Now, to me, both of those show how dangerous the problem is and that the minister doesn't understand the problem. First of all, it should not be in his power either to direct where the contract goes or to stop the contract once it's awarded. So for him to say to the public, I stop the contract, bothers me. What should have happened is that his permanent secretary should have said, I, the permanent secretary, followed this procedure to award the contract and defended himself. Or if it's, his act conduct was indefensible, he should have been fired. But it shouldn't have involved the minister. If the minister has the power to stop the contract going on, that same minister has the power to award the contract. And that is dangerous. And the second thing is that the issue was exposed, according to the newspaper reports, because of this APNU mole, this APNU traitor there in the ministry. But I find that APNU traitor to be a very useful fellow because it is only when your enemy, when the person opposed to you is there in a position to scrutinize what you are doing and see what you are doing, that the public found out. Of course he told the public because he's opposed to the minister, but that's not a bad thing. In a democracy, you are entitled to support the party of your choice. And in a transparent system, it is that same enemy that you need to have in the system to scrutinize what you are doing, to be part of it. Because if you exclude that man, if you fire that APNU supporter, so that you ensure that you are there cloistered only with loyal PPP supporters who blindly support what you're doing, then you can make all the corrupt decisions you want and there's nobody to ring the bell. There's nobody to sound the alarm. That bothers me. And I keep saying, and I want to say again and again, whatever government is in place, the opposition needs as of right, not as of grace, not as, of, as, as some kind of um, privilege, but by right to have members sitting at each commission, each board, seeing what is going on. I learned a new trick the other day. I want to share this trick with you. It, it came by rumor, so it may or may not be true, but the source of it makes me believe it has a ring of truth. Before the elections, the Chronicle, which was run by APNU, Moses Nagamutu, made a lot of libelous comments about PPP officials. You will remember the expression air fraud and the 19 charges, which everybody knows were politically motivated, but they made a lot of damaging comments against different PPP officials. Then the elections came, APNU was removed, and a new board was put into place in the same chronicle. But that board was a PPP board, which replaced an APNU board. And I heard that some of those former opposition officials who had been libeled, they sued the newspaper. But now when the lawsuit is pending, the newspaper is no longer their enemy because the government has changed. And the board that is now friendly is meeting to say we can settle these lawsuits. Now that would be an interesting trick because if your friendly board is now settling your lawsuit when you sued and it was your enemy on the board, I think that I would be much more comfortable if they had two APNU representatives on that board and a small party independent on that board to sit down and say, 
you must be mad. You want to settle and pay money to your friend in respect of a libel published by this newspaper under a previous regime, that cannot happen. If you don't have that kind of scrutiny, that kind of transparency, if you don't have your enemy sitting there at the table, you can make secret deals. You can give secret handshakes, secret contracts, secret awards. We need transparency. And we can't just sit and say, oh, APNU have not sat in parliament. They need as of right. We, the other parties, need as of right to be sitting on these commissions, sitting on these boards, so that we can scrutinize what's going on. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I totally agree with you. Um, I think the word that is most commonly used is accountability. Holding the government accountable for what is being done. I would like to end the show tonight on a positive note to say to the audience that here on the ground, I've seen a lot of efforts from the ministers. Um, Honorable Priya Manichan has been going into the interior region, sharing out educational material to the children that have not had anything. We have seen um, Honorable Huang Edgehill going into communities, speaking to people. And these are on Saturdays and Sundays, the dedication in the middle of COVID, it's commendable. So I would urge them to continue along that path. I've seen efforts being made to listen to the people, to listen to the diaspora, to listen to us, the independent opposition. And there are talks about listening to the other opposition, even though they have their little quarrel going on between them. But ultimately, I will end by saying that what we need is for everybody to come together, put aside the differences and focus on the people of Guyana. And only by focusing on the needs of the people and putting all pride aside can we move forward. So thank you, gentlemen, once again. Thank you to the audience. Um, before I leave, I would like everybody to know that um, there is a new program that is coming out specifically about oil and gas in Guyana. All the information you need to know, educational discussions, um, it can be found on Guy Energy page, so please tune in when you see it coming over. If you want to know anything about oil and gas, that information will be given to you. So have a good night, everyone, and let's keep positive. Nice talking to you, Asho.